starting off chapter uh, three in Galatians tonight. Yes, indeed. As we're continuing to move through our epistles. And, uh, hmm? I don't know. According to this, it is. All right. Um, are we? Are we live? Or Yeah? Okay. All right. Let's open up some prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your word here tonight, Lord. We thank you for our little church here, Lord. And we certainly do invite your Holy Spirit to be with us, to open our eyes and our hearts for the message you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Paul is still working through some issues in Galatia. Well, the church is up there, rather. It's a, it's a big um, Roman province up there, which we now call Turkey. And... There was problems, uh, just like over in Corinth, in a, a whole few hundred miles away with the Judaizers kind of following around, doing their thing, you know, spreading rumors and talking a bunch of trash about Paul. But it was causing some of the, the, the members of the church to start questioning their faith and to start questioning the truth that they'd been taught about the gospel um, as these guys were kind of trying to um, not really rewrite the gospel, but come up with kind of their own version of it that fit their agendas better. And talking to the younger members of the church that were more vulnerable to uh, uh, suggestion, I guess you might say. And so as Paul's getting here, getting this letter to them, there's already starting to become some divisions and cliques in the church because of this stuff. And of course, these these Judaizers were never around. They would kind of pop in, do their damage, and they would pop out. And wherever Paul went, he would preach and share the gospel, and then they would come in behind him and kind of um, not, not really correct what he was saying, but they would um, kind of come up with a, a better way to say it or something like that to fit their agendas better. And it was very confusing for the early church to try to um, listen to Paul, this great teacher and then have these guys that were you know coming up from jerusalem that you know they had a reputation of being you know pretty pretty well versed in the bible but the fact of the matter was they kind of had their own agendas going on and so as we see as we go through this stuff i think you'll notice that we're dealing with that a lot of that today in our own country here where um, we've been raised up as a nation a God-fearing nation a, and a Christian nation. And in the last, you know, few decades and stuff like that, there's been some primarily like um, within the college level that are um, kind of trying to rewrite the history of our country and rewrite the ideas of what Christianity is all about. And some of the younger, more vulnerable are kind of falling for a lot of this nonsense. And you can see them on the news just about every night, you know, trying to break into a college dorm or a building or something like that. And <clears throat> it's really uh, it's really troubling to see that going on. But it's all biblical, and so we're going to follow along in chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, you foolish Galatians. Have, have any of you ever looked at some of the, the protest stuff and thought, oh, you foolish people? Anybody in here? They don't know what the heck they're half of them. I don't even know if any of them, but um, quite a bit when they're questioned about that, they don't really know what the heck it is that they're protesting for or really any of the details or anything of that nature, but they're very passionate about what they don't know, if that makes any kind of sense. And the same thing was happening here. He said, who bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. You guys all know this stuff. That's why you came to the faith in the first place. In, in that region up there that was predominantly Gentiles, not very many Jews up there, and the, the early church went up there, Peter, and then, of course, Paul went up, and um, people like Timothy and Barnabas, and they reached those Galatians with the good news of Christ, and they all went, yeah, man, we want that. That's what we want. And they all fell in love with the Lord. The churches were developed. And then along come these people um, who are trying to kind of, um, 
they were trying to twist him up into kind of believing, which is still be still believed sometimes in our country, that works will get you into heaven. That there's more than one way to heaven. There's you can be like good. You can be really, really, really good, and uh, and God will allow you into heaven. And that right there is a lie from the pit of hell. And the only thing those people have to look forward to are having the enemy laugh in their face for all eternity while they spend that time in hell. And Paul's going, look, who, who, and this word bewitch, it's really, a, it's really a cool word. You know, we, uh, we kind of, for some of us here, it brings back the, remember the lady with the nose? Samantha Stevens, was it? Yeah, bewitched and stuff like that. But I think they were just going for the word witch because she was like a witch or something like that. But it really means to, to tell lies about someone in a way to damage their character. To, for me to, to basically, in our vernacular, it would be gossip. To gossip about somebody so that he would look down upon those guys over there. You know, he might be friends with them or know them and stuff like that. But then I could you know, tell him a few things about him, and he would look at him very differently after that. It's, it's a form of brainwashing, actually. It's getting him to think and do the things that I want him to do without thinking for himself, and, and that, by definition, is foolish, because God all gave us a brain between our own ears to think with, amen? And I got to share something that is going to be very shocking to all of you tonight, but it's the truth. Not everything in social media is true. True statement. There's a lot of stuff on social media that's just downright false, man. It's not, it's not true at all. And, and furthermore, quite a bit of it is meant to be a joke. But people take it seriously, and then they perpetuate it by sharing it around with all their foolish friends. And then before long, you have an entire movement about something that's absolutely hollow and has no substance to it whatsoever. And that's what was going on here. There was an agenda. Ultimately, the agenda with the Judaizers was... They wanted the Gentile church to first become Jews by ritual, um, by following dietary rules, um, observing Sabbath and all the other festivals, and for the boys, getting clipped as well. And, and of course, the boys up in Galatia went, I don't think so, man. No. Who even, like, that's just creepy right off the bat. I mean, no, we're not going to do that. And Paul's stance was, look, Jesus, Jesus came to, to reach the lost and broken as you are, the way you are. That's the whole crux of Christianity right there. Anybody can be a Christian. You can grow up a Muslim. You can grow up a Jehovah's Witness. You can grow up a murderer. Whatever your thing is, when we come to Christ and receive him as our Lord and Savior, we've been forgiven of those sins, amen? And we, therefore, now are a Christian. There's, there's no hoops that we need to jump through. There's only one sin that's unforgivable, and that's rejecting Christ as Savior, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Beyond that, Jesus came for the lost. I mean, can you imagine if the rules were that we all had to get our stuff together before we could come to Christ? How, how empty would this room be right now? There wouldn't be a whole lot of us in here, would there? I mean, obviously, the truth is we couldn't get our stuff together without Christ. And it was only after Christ that we were able to find a life again and some fulfillment and, and a life worth living. Amen. So he's going, who, who did this to you? He already knew who it was. He'd been dealing with these guys for some time now. But he's questioning them. Why did you let these people do that to you? Why didn't you do your own research? Why didn't you go to the, the early leaders of the church, like Barnabas or Timothy or Silas or, or even Paul himself. Why are you allowing these people so much rent in your brain for free? And they're not even paying rent there. And then they, then they go away and leave you holding the bag. You're like the lone ranger there looking like a dimwit trying to argue these points out with people that are absolutely not biblical. So he goes, look, he's, he says that, this only I want to I want to learn from you. And, and in Bible talk or Paul's talk, is this, this is all I want to know from you guys. I got one question for you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? The very thing that brought you in in the first place, our flesh, our sinful nature, 
that convinced us that we had that of a great need for a savior in our life was it the works of, of you washing enough camels or whatever they did back in those days uh, feeding the homeless or anything like that that got you saved or was it by hearing the word of God well ultimately all of them would have to answer well it was you you know you and and all the other guys that were that were coming up here preaching to us the word of God that's what that's what stuck in our heart and, and, and gave us that, that desire and that hunger to know God. It had nothing to do with what we were doing because none of them were doing anything in terms of works, and, which means like uh, obeying the law. How, they didn't even know what the law was up there until these guys came up there and started kind of laying it all out to him. So Paul's going, how does it go? How do you, I mean, what Paul's trying to do is kind of like shake them into thinking. Stop for a second, all your blah, 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 stuff going on. And think about this for a second. Was it your sinful nature that you you were you were saved from through the cross, the Spirit of God, and it's now that same sinful nature that's making you a better Christian? Does that even make sense? If you came if you came to Christ as an alcoholic, and He delivered you from that, and and you began this this entire new life, like actually keeping a job or something like that, having a home or things like that that brought happiness and now you feel like getting drunk every night is going to make you a better christian does that even kind of make sense or any other number of things that we did before christ that are going to make us better and he's trying to reason with them in a way that maybe they can understand because they're already in a confused state now we all know by the word of god that confusion is not of god right so if it's not of god then who's it of absolutely and Paul's, Paul's not, like, mad. He's trying to help them kind of shake the cobwebs loose. He goes, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? All the stuff that you guys have been through, families turning against you, maybe even employers firing you because now you're part of the, the, the way, this uh, Christian religion, or the Romans, you know, making threats to you and others around you and stuff like that. all that stuff you did because of a belief that was in your heart that was so powerful you were willing to sacrifice and go down that road was all that for nothing now because these guys a few guys just popped in here with these ideas and ideologies and all of a sudden you're just going to turn your back on all of that stuff there I, I can see that like in my head you know the the for the this group of men and women to kind of start looking around each other like, yeah, what the heck were we thinking, man? How did we fall for that so easy? But you know what? It's super easy to fall for an okie doke because there's people out there. Maybe you've known one or two in the course of your life, but there's people out there that are master manipulators. And they'll study you to find out what your weaknesses are and, and the chinks in your armor so they can get in there and start twisting things and they're very talented with their words to to come across as your friend or someone that just cares about you man you know and you're being taken for a ride over there at the roadhouse biker church man you know before long who knows what they're going to be expecting of you over there they might even have you praying for people or something god forbid you know is that really what you want i don't think so so he goes therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Does God bring miracles about in your life by you creating a spiritual scorecard between you and God where you can say, I did this, 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 and this. I think I'm due for a miracle now. I've done ten things, and you haven't done one for me. So... I think maybe it's about time. But he goes, look, is, is this person the one that supplies all this stuff that's been pouring all these miracles out? Since you've been walking with him, don't forget that part. Since you've been walking with him, miracles have been happening. You guys have seen it. You've seen healings. You've seen people raised from the dead. You've seen situations that probably absolutely should have ended in your death or something else miraculously be taken care of. And you've all attributed that to God. You've given God the glory. Now, all of a sudden, you're coming and saying to me, well, according to these guys, you know, we need to do this, 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 and this in order to, like, kind of qualify now for miracles. Does that sound like the God that we serve? Certainly not the God I serve. 
what the God that I serve hears our faith. And, and not just us, you know, praying and things like that. He knows what, what we're doing. He knows when you've been sleeping. And he knows when you're awake. And he knows when you've been bad and good. So don't try to be no fake. I made that last part up. I know. Yeah. Isn't that funny how songs about Santa Claus are way more related to Jesus? Amen. I wonder if that's how it was originally when they wrote them. Right? And then somewhere along the line. Anyway, that's for a whole nother Bible study. But look what he says here. Just as Abraham believed God and was accounted him to be right, accounted him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Those that believe as Abraham believed. How did Abraham believe? Well, when God told him to move, what did he do? He moved. How about that little thing up on a the mountain there? When he told him to sacrifice his only son. What did he do? He went up there and got the wood, got the knife, got the kid. They're cruising up the mountain. The kid's like, hey, so, Dad, where's the, uh, where's the lamb at? He's like, oh, God will provide. <laughs> yeah. And then when he was tying his son up and stuff like that, I don't know, man. Abraham was pretty old at that time, you know, and I was thinking that the kid could have whipped him, you know, or at least run. <laughs> but he was really obedient. But what kind of... Uh, what kind of therapy do you think he needed after that whole episode? <laughs> what do you think he told mom that dad did up on the mountain? Right? Don't tell your mother what we did. Sure, dad. I just want to tell you, yell a knife to my throat. Yeah. He had, he had that faith that whatever God said to do, he didn't question it. He just did it. He just did it based on the fact that he knew that God's will was perfect in every way. And that, and that his own wasn't. And this is the faith that, that Paul's talking about here. And it's interesting that he goes to Abraham because the Judaizers were bringing Moses in and the law. That's what they kept trying to cram down their throats. So Paul went a few hundred years before Moses and went to Abraham before the law was even around. The law hadn't even been, been written yet. It was just all about faith in God. And so you can see Paul gently trying to bring them back through a really cool history lesson. And then he goes on like this and says... Uh, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying and you all the nations shall be blessed so then those who are by faith are blessed with the belief with believe in Abraham and here we are today in America we're, we're not in Israel um, I don't even know if we if we have Jewish people in our family and that's that's totally cool and awesome if we do but we're living that verse right there that was spoken to that was spoken in regard to Abraham, that in you all nations shall be blessed. And I'll tell you what, this nation right here is a very young nation, actually. We're, we're not, we haven't been around as long as, like, you know, nations like Egypt or China or something like that. But look at what we've accomplished in the 200, what are we, 250 years now? Is that where we're at, roughly, as a nation? Look what we've accomplished in that time frame as far as the Industrial Revolution, finances, military, the the roads around the the freeway systems the rail systems there's so much that we've accomplished and when you go back to the beginning the founding of our nation all the documents and our founders believed together collectively on one thing god almighty that this nation was founded on god and here we are and now we're in a we're in a strange time in our history where those that history is is being attempted to be rewritten and changed it's, it's not, it's not going to happen, and it is a weird time for our country right now, but this much I can tell you, America is resilient. We have bounced back from a lot of stuff, actually. The Depression, the Dust Bowls, a couple of world wars as well, Vietnam, wars in the Middle East, and we've always managed to come back together. And here's the crazy thing, too, about America that I've noticed, that we can be so divided and so hateful towards each other and then something bad happens, like a, an attack or an earthquake or you know a big hurricane or something like that. And Americans come together, man, and they take care of each other. And they're very generous and they're very giving and they're very loving. Because at the core of it all, no matter what our political differences are, we're still one nation under God. Amen. And we do come together as patriots, amen. And this is all coming from way back 
before Moses and the law. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with the law. The law is good. There's, there's a lot of great stuff in the law. There's a lot of stuff that has been written beyond it by man. And this is where we get doctrine. So this is why we're a non-denominational church, because I personally, um, I'm fond of just following the word of God, the way the word of God is written, amen, without um, laying a bunch of rules and regulations on people that Jesus never laid on me, amen. So there are people that are agenda-driven, and these Judaizers were absolutely agenda-driven, and mainly because they saw success. Remember in Jerusalem right now during this time, they were hitting everybody up for money. They were all broke in Jerusalem. There was a lot of persecution, and, and Rome was, you know, being a real problem for them and things of that nature. But nonetheless, all these Gentile churches like Macedonia and eventually even Corinth and up here in Galatia, they were all taking up collections and sending them back to Jerusalem to help supply them with food and stuff like that. And it was funny, man, in Acts, uh, I don't know, around 9 or 10 or 11, they had the Jerusalem Council is when they were debating over whether the Gentiles, you know, are going to be clipped or not. And Paul went in there and told him, look, you know, nobody called me to be here. I'm here because I've been sent by revelation or apocalypsis. I've come here because Jesus told me to come here to work this stuff out. And, and as they talked and stuff, they kind of relented and like, okay, well, they don't need to be clipped, but we don't want them drinking like bloody food and stuff like that or eating bloody food like they got to make sure all the blood's out of it. And, and I'm cool with that. Like I shared with you last week, pork and chicken. I don't eat bloody pork and chicken personally myself. Um, steak, yeah, why not, man? God gave me fangs for a reason, you know. But what they did include, though, was don't forget the poor. That was like like the only three things that they had they wanted to bring in the the Jerusalem council, they added those couple things and then said, but don't forget about us. Remember, you know, don't forget to take care of the poor. And we are poor here in Jerusalem. So let's not get crazy and not keep bringing the blessings. Amen. Agendas and church, man, they, they go hand in hand. And, and it's, we've all seen, you know, the horrors of cults and things like that, you know, where maybe someone started off. Okay. Like a lot of these Judaizers, I'm sure, um, they started, well, Paul's a perfect example, actually. Paul, you know, being as educated as he was, he really believed that the Christian church was enemies of God and that they were going to tear down the, the sanctity of Judaism. And so he went around and got lots of them killed. You know, he didn't personally kill them, but he went and took names at their churches and their meetings, and he turned them over to the Romans, and the Romans went in there and snatched them up and off to the Colosseums or wherever the heck they went to, to kill him. So Paul had a pretty hardcore ideology coming in, but then Jesus, of course, on the road to Damascus, had that encounter with him. And all of that knowledge and passion that Paul had for the law, he just transferred it right over to the gospel and the good news. And he was quite a fighter early on, as we've been learning through all these epistles for the early church. And we are the beneficiaries of all that 2,000 years later. Because here we are in a free nation preaching at a church without people coming in the door with AK-47s. Amen? Hallelujah. I know that we, we don't think about that stuff very much, the freedoms that we do have in this country. We can go out and pray in public without any fear of being scooped up and taken to some re-education camp somewhere. But right now around the world, those things are happening all over the place, man. In China, the Middle East, there's places where if you even you even speak the word Jesus, man, you're in big trouble. And if you get caught with a Bible, you're probably going to die for it. Yeah, we take them for granted, and oftentimes they sit on a coffee table collecting dust. Amen? Not that anybody here does that, I'm saying. It's at the other churches, the other, the other guys out there that, that do that sort of thing, right? He goes, for as many as are of works of the law are under the curse for it is written cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them this was a shot right back and this was deuteronomy this wasn't like something paul came up with that god's word says this if if you're going to follow the law then you have to follow all of it every single bit of it you can't break any of it at all and there was a reason for that because when we get over into like uh I guess uh, maybe Luke 
four ish or something like that, maybe four or seven. Um, there's a great verse that says, uh, "Judge not, lest you be judged by the same measure that you use." So if if we're going to judge people based on our perception of how they should or shouldn't be living, then they better be living exactly to the letter of the very law that they're preaching out at you. And I'm here to tell you that they're not. It, it's not even possible to live to the letter of the law. That was the whole point of Jesus being the propitiation of our sin. We couldn't live up to it. And there was nothing that we could do. There was no sacrifice. None of our blood was pure. It was all tainted with sin. It was only through Christ. And so the whole the whole justification process of the Old Testament with the, the sacrificing of animals was just a band-aid to keep to keep them moving forward till we got to this point of all the prophecy that was being that was being talked about about this Messiah coming, that that sin would be taken away. But it was never meant to justify. In fact, he's going to say here in a second that the law never justified anybody. It was it was a it was kind of like if if you took like three or four million people and put them all in a pack and started moving across the desert without any regulations. It would be chaos. Well, they had regulations, and it was still chaos, even even with the regulations. It was about civility and trying to trying to move this this massive group of people to the promised land without everybody coming up with their own idea of how things should be done. If we took a minute, if we took like one night here at the roadhouse and said, "Okay, so what is the best way to conduct a ride from point A to point B?" Everybody get a piece of paper and write down your opinion on how a train of motorcycles should be moved down a highway on and off freeways and through stoplights and stuff like that. If there was 50 of us here, you would have 50 different versions of it. And, and, they would, and some of them would be very wacky because motorcycles don't fly. They just don't. Unless you hit something. I've made my motorcycles fly a couple of times, actually, sadly. The idea is there had to be a set pattern for everybody to follow but it would never justify anybody and and what i mean by justify is to be made holy to be made righteous there's no way it could have happened but it made for great guidelines to follow through and live a good godly life but there was still sin within our our sinful nature within our hearts that we couldn't fix there was no way the wages of sin is death, and there are none righteous, not even one, according to the Bible. So that was kind of like a, it was, the fix was already in. We were done for, and everybody is done for that's out there that doesn't know Jesus their Savior, according to what I believe in the Word of God. So we have a responsibility, don't we, to get out there and share our faith with that lost and broken world. So he's going, look, cursed is everyone who doesn't continue to do every little thing. And these people that are coming to you and telling you, you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this. If you were a fly on their wall, you'd be astounded at what they do. If you, if you could be a fly on a wall and anybody in church here or there or anywhere else, you'd be aghast at what these hardcore Christians are really like when nobody's watching. Except God is watching. Amen. And, and eventually you start learning as time goes by that God is watching. And God is the way maker in our life, not the people that we're worried about finding out our dirty little secrets. It's God's the one that brings the increase into our life, that brings the blessings, the miracles, and everything that brings joy and happiness from deep inside. Not externally, like you get a new bike, yay, I'm happy. And that makes people happy, right? But it's temporal. It doesn't last forever. But this joy that I'm referring to that comes by the blood of Christ, it's forever. And you can feel it and sense that it's forever in your heart. That's why when we get close to Jesus and we're walking with him, when we blow it, that's what messes us up so bad. That's why we feel guilty and ashamed at what we're doing. Even though nobody else in the whole world may ever know or ever find out, although you might be surprised at how many people know. <laughs> That's all another Bible study. That's what draws us back to Christ. Uh, Psalm 32 with David, one of my favorite psalms. That was his deal. He, he, was, he was rebelling against coming clean with God. Yet God kept pressing him and pressing him. Not only God press him, but God put in his sight happy people. People that were joyful, that were walking right with God. And he's like, man, I wish I could be like them again feel like I'm a million miles away from God. And eventually David did cave in 
and God forgave the guilt of his sin. For us, our sin has been forgiven. So the guilt that we carry, it's good in the sense that it draws us back to God when we're being stupid. But we can't, we can't hold the we can't hold the sin against ourselves. In other words, we can't, we can't not forgive ourselves for the sins that we commit because Jesus already forgave us of those sins. And far be it from us to say what he did on that cross was for nothing. Yeah, we're going to blow it and we're going to make mistakes, but you know what? We serve an awesome, loving God and a forgiving God, and all we need to do is go to him with those mistakes that we made, confess them, and turn away from them, and never go back. Amen? Is that that hard to do? Sometimes it is, ain't it? Sometimes the flesh is so strong, right? Well, the spirit can be stronger, amen? Trust the Lord. So he goes on to say this, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does who does them shall live by them. So God's saying there's nothing wrong with the laws. It's good. They're good. All right, don't steal your neighbor's cow, man. That's not cool. It's just not all right. I mean, we can all agree on that, right? Uh, lying and cheating, false witnessing, the adultery, the murder, you know, that's not okay either. You know, you can't just go around murdering people, man. It's not all right. And at some point, you need to stop. Are there any serial killers in here? Just checking, just one. All right. Praise the Lord. We already knew that about you, though. But he's going, that's not the deal. That was so freaking far behind, man. That was like seconds late. Yeah, you know, we ought to call her Echo. That's pretty much a good name for her right there. You go, no one's justified by the law, but in the sight of God is evidence, for the just shall live by faith. That's how we live. We live by faith. Now that we believe, we believe by faith in Christ, we believe by faith that Jesus died on the cross for us, we believe by faith that we're a new creation and the old one is gone. We believe all this by faith. The law is not going to change any of that, although we can learn from the law. We can, we can learn things, and, and the law was really good in that it taught people things. Like maybe he thought, that it was okay, you know, to kill cats. Maybe that was his thing. He's like, yeah, nobody likes cats, so I'm going to kill them. And, and then over here, she's like, oh, no, dude, that's not okay. I like cats. You can't kill cats. Well, my opinion is I can, and your opinion is I can't. Boom, the law came along and said, hey, check it out, dude. Oy vey, don't kill the cat, man. Right, lay off the cats, dude. You don't like them, don't go around them, but quit going to your neighbor's house and killing the cats, all right? It's just not all right. Now we had a law. We had a standard by which to stand by. The law is that. It's a standard, amen? However, you're still going to sin and fall short of the glory of God. No matter how hard you try to keep the law, something's going to come along. Someone's going to cut you off on the freeway, and you're going to sin, amen? You're going to get a letter from the IRS that says you owe another 1000 bucks on your taxes, and you're going to sin. Dropping f bombs all over the yard and stuff like that. Welcome to the human race, amen. But Jesus died that we might be forgiven of those sins. The problems start to come into play when we start to transgress, when we start to plan stuff out, where we don't sin by losing our temper or making a mistake or something. But when we meticulously start working it all out, man, setting up times and doing this and that, and setting people up, whatever it is, that, that's a whole nother problem with God because now we're, we're not just sinning, but we're in open rebellion to him. And, and all these blessings that we still want and we desire, man, yet we're willing to, like, we'll take all the, the cool stuff, but we're going to put you on the shelf for a couple of days because I got some stuff I need to do over here and you don't want to know about it, man, so... Go hang out with Crusher and watch him. He's got plenty of stuff to keep you busy. That boy. It doesn't work that way, man. God's omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's all over. Everywhere that we are, everything that we do, God's watching. Okay, that's cool, and that's the truth. But isn't it, isn't it cooler, though, to be pleasing unto God, though? To do things knowing that, that God is with us at all times. Doesn't it behoove us to, to choose in our own heart to do things that, 
that he loves to see us do that brings him joy and brings glory unto him and not unto us, even though we still get glorified through him because he's just cool that way. The laws, the, it says here, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. So we're called to live by faith, not by sight, not by doing things. In fact, uh, what's it? What's that over in Ephesians? Um, or by faith we've been saved. By grace we've been saved through faith. I always get that one backwards. By grace we've been saved through faith. That not of ourself, not of works. So no one can boast about it. No one can say, hey, you know, the reason your life sucks is because you got no works, man. You're, you're not doing anything for the Lord. You're not, you're not following the letter of the law, man. You're not... You're not doing nothing on Sabbath. You're not, you know, following the dietary rules and things like that. You know, of course your life sucks. Why wouldn't it suck? You, you're living like a heathen. I got some news for you, man. If that's where you're at, the heathens are doing just fine by Jesus that have given their life to Christ. Amen. They're a new creation. Yeah, they came up through some hard times. Is there anybody in this, in this room right now that came up through some pretty brutal stuff in life? One or two of us, I'm sure. Anybody ever done anything you're ashamed of? Or you were ashamed of at the time? You can't change it, can you? Nothing you can do about it, so you can use it. You can use it for the kingdom of God. You can, have, you can find victory and help others find victory that are living that same life that you've been delivered from, man. You don't need to throw all that stuff away. It's valuable. It's very valuable to the lost out there. He says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become the curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. On that cross at Calvary, that was a wooden cross, by the way. Some tree gave up his life for Christ. I think that's a Bible study, by the way. I don't know. I can, I can sense it in my head right there that some tree sacrificed itself for Jesus. But anyway, that, that debt had to be paid, and that was the debt. That was the payment. What a harsh payment, huh? I mean, I mean maybe if it's like, okay, so you sin and you've fallen short, you got to give up all your guitars and one of your bikes. Like, ah, that sucks, man. I must have sinned really bad then, huh? I got a couple guitars. <laughs> a couple dozen, I don't know. That wasn't the penalty. The penalty was death. There's no middle ground. You sinned. And, and, and this is from, from birth. We, we were born into this sinful nature. It, we were already pronounced guilty. It was a done deal. It was just a matter of time. When you died, yet at just the right moment, Christ died for the ungodly, all of us. At just the right moment, someone came into your life by the, by the revelation of Jesus to come into your life and said all the words that you needed to hear by the Holy Spirit for you to go, all right, enough with this madness that I've been living all these years. I need Jesus as my Savior, and boom. You gave your life to Christ, and here you sit tonight, a new creation. Where in the world would you have been today if not for Christ at that moment in your life? Would any of you even be alive in here? Probably not, man. But he became that curse for us. The curse being the sin, the, the payment being death, he took our place of that. Can you imagine? A, sin, a sinless life that he led, yet he loved us through the eons, man. Each and every one in this room, individually and uniquely, loved you so much that he was willing to do that. And not just the cross. There was a lot that happened before the cross as well that led up to the cross. But he saw you through this. Well, of course, he's God, so he knows. But have you ever, have you ever just, like... Given it, like, take a minute to think about this. What if you could be there that day that he was crucified? That you could gaze upon him, everything that he went through, the the way he looked after the beatings and the scourgings and all that, and the and being crucified and nailed to this horrible cross and dying this agonizing death, and being able to look at his eyes, knowing that he just did all that for you, standing right before him. I know it seems dramatic and all that stuff, but that's exactly what happened 2,000 years ago. He did that. And, and to this day right now, we can still gaze upon the face of Christ. We can go to him in prayer, and we can thank him. And I don't know if, if maybe if you have or you haven't, 
really honestly thank Jesus for what he did on our behalf and the life that he gave us. And he didn't have to. Amen? He didn't have to. So here's where uh, we wrap up. Curse the tree. That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That same, the same promise that was given unto Abraham, the same Spirit that was poured out upon Abraham, the very same Spirit that, that came down upon Jesus in the baptism, the same Spirit at Pentecost, the same Spirit that we all have indwelled within us, that same Spirit all the way back, because we are the Gentiles. We are the world. Lee. But here we are. A new creation in Christ. Amen. Through the blood of Christ. How much of your righteousness is self-righteous behavior? That's a heavy question, huh? How much is your righteousness being right with God? How much is your 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 attempt to be right with God self-righteous, self-seeking, to, to bring attention onto yourself or a pat on, you pat yourself on the back or a pat from others. Is, 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 your, is your attempt to be right with God um, humble and that nobody needs to know? No, but nobody needs to know the things that you do or the prayers that you pray or whatever, that your relationship is strictly between you and God. Your desire is to please God. That's your desire. Or do is there little little pieces that try to sneak in that that you you still require um, some glory, some attention from others to to see your good works. Now I'll, I'll tell you the answer to that. It it probably is that we do have some self righteous behavior because again we have a sinful nature and we're human. And people do um, people do want to be um, what's the word. Um, credited, there's another term for it though, but get credit for something your blank face is telling me you don't know. Okay, that's cool. Just just one of those interesting questions to ponder. How much of your righteousness is self-righteous behavior? And, that, and I'm not knocking anybody because I'm guilty too, you know, but when we, when we come down to the core of who and what we are in Christ, really, our, our real true desire in our heart ought not be so much about ourself and, and getting our own accolades and things like that, but to please the one and only God, the one that sent his only begotten son to save us. And there's, there's great benefits of pleasing God because in the process of pleasing God, we become obedient and we become less rebellious towards him. We start becoming like-minded with him. In other words, the things that we used to think were cool, that God never thought were cool, as, as we start changing, we start seeing things the way God sees them, that, you know, jokes that used to be really funny aren't, just aren't that funny anymore. It's not about being religious or anything like that. It's just that we're not the same people that we were before. We're, we're changing. We're becoming mature in Christ. Amen? And it all comes through the washing of the Word. And again, I'm not talking about being legalistic. I'm talking about a change in our very, in our very spirit. As we draw nearer to God, he draws nearer to us. Amen? But if we're still promoting the opera ministry and me, 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 then it's going to take a little bit longer. Amen? What drives us to get in Dad's way in our life? What are the things that we do? What are the things going on in your life? I don't want to answer nothing like that. We all know what they are. We know the things that get in God's way of our life, the things that we put in his way, the things that we do, the actions that we take, um, Again, back to the self, the self-serving nature that we are sometimes, that we can be sometimes, is we're, you know, the the Israelites were stiff-necked and spoiled brats, and you know the fact is we can be that way too. I know you may not want to admit it, but that's okay. That's a problem you'll have to deal with. <laughs> anyway, that's a whole nother Bible study in and of itself. What's getting in God's way of working in your life right now? I mean, I know He's working in all of our lives because we're here, we're fellowshipping. But are there things going on in your life that you know for a fact that aren't pleasing to God that now for whatever reason you're tangled up in them you either just like it too much and you can't turn away from it or you're trapped in something that you can't get out of now because you started something that now you're wrapped up in you know what trust in the Lord man pray through and step off amen walk to the light 
Just head for Jesus, man. Things will change, and it probably won't be as drastic and horrible as you think it's going to be, man. Again, oh foolish ones, we, we fall for the devil's lies all the time, man. And we ought not fall for him because he's the father of lies. Of course, he's going to tell you, well, if you stop that, it's never going to happen again for you. Or if you stop doing that over there, you'll be broke, man. You're going to lose everything you've worked so hard for. All good gifts come from the Father, man. They all come from above. And the second we start thinking that we're all that and we've created all this, the second that you're probably going to get humbled by God, and it's going to suck. Amen? But it won't be done out of anger and meanness. It'll be done to bring you back because you're on a very, very slippery slope. And all I'm trying to say here tonight, according to the Word of God, all we need to do is turn around and come back home. Man. That's all. So here's the application. Now, when it comes to faith, Stay in your lane. <laughs> Dad's got this, man. He's really good at the faith thing. He's been doing it for a long, long time. Amen. I mean, he's got it down. There, in fact, it's flawless, man. There's nothing to improve upon. Amen. And, and I have a little note I wrote up here, and it says this. Faith makes room for the Spirit to work in us and through us. Flesh is stubborn, rebellious, self-seeking, religious, and churchy man-made that's just something to think about right there when we're talking about getting in God's way are we making stuff in our lives that are clearly man-made and not God-sanctioned or God-approved I don't know welcome to the human race there's freedom in Christ receive the blessing amen, amen. let's pray Father we thank you now for your word and as we, uh, as we wrap up tonight Father our desire is that everybody knows your son is Savior tonight Lord um we lift up those that are out and about on the road right now um, around the country here, Father. We do ask for trial and mercies. Those that are that are participating in the rolling glory for, Father, as those plans are being made, Lord, I ask you to continue to bring liaisons together, Father, bring communities together, bring states together, Lord, as we come together as a nation here to stand with Israel, Father, through this very difficult time. But right now, in this moment, Father, our desire is that everybody knows your Son is Savior, Father. Lord, that's why we're here. That's why we love you and why we serve you and why we come here, Father, that we can fellowship, we can grow, we can equip each other, we can pray with each other. And, Lord, if it be your will, bring in folks here that don't know your son and hear the gospel for the first time. And so tonight, Lord, we pray that that's happening here, that it's happened out there in TV land, Father. And as we pray together, Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to have his way in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you pray with me, Father God? I sin against you, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. To fill me with your Holy Spirit. And put me on that road that you'll let me travel. In Jesus' name, amen? amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. He's so awesome, isn't he? Hey, there's going to be girls praying over there. How you doing there, Glenn? Am I keeping you awake? Okay. Girls praying over there, guys praying over there. Come get some prayer. Don't be a swayer. And I will see you all on Saturday. God bless you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. You.